My name is Brian Buckley. Uh, I'm a career diplomat. Uh, my wife and I were in the service for 30 odd years. I guess 30 odd is about the right way to describe it. Project 4000, uh, it goes way back. It goes back to 1979 in our case. Uh, on a personal basis, uh, my, my wife, my family and I had just come back from a posting. We'd been in Madrid for four years. We got back into Ottawa in July, I guess, of 1979. And friends whom we could have lost track of but reconnected with uh, told us about uh, what was going on. The city was all abuzz with this effort, this large-scale effort to resettle uh, uh, in the, uh, South Vietnamese and uh, uh, Southeast Asian uh, refugees in Ottawa. Uh, we formed a group of, uh, I guess there were probably uh, 8, 10, 12, something like that involved. And our basic function was to give uh, core support to this refugee family that was arriving very shortly afterwards. Uh, there were a family of four, um, husband, wife, and, uh, and two kids, as I recall. Um, and our role was to help them find housing, find employment, and just basically help, help them to settle in. Uh, in Ottawa. Now this is a sponsor group, sponsorship group of uh, an Alta Vista community, very close to where we are right now actually, uh, that was set up in the summer of 1979 to help a family by the name of New, N-H-I-E-U, and the names were Ralph, Mai, Howard, and Sue. Uh, as I say, they were a delightful family, the little bit we saw of them, a uh, fantastic work ethic that uh, Howard displayed, and they moved on to Toronto sometime uh, in, uh, in the fall of that year. And for all I know, they may still be there. But that is kind of representative. These were, they were largely, we knew these folks through church and neighborhood. And that was pretty representative of how the groups came together at that time. Basically, there was a, uh, it was something of a luminous summer in Ottawa that year. I mean, there was a great deal of popular support for doing something positive. And uh, I guess the key thing was the, uh, the opinion leaders were all pretty much on board. I mean, the mayor was on board. Uh, in fact, she was the moving spirit behind it all. Uh, that said, there was some opposition to it. Uh, in fact, later, I think Howard Edelman in Toronto had done some research and subsequently found that uh, very rarely was there majority support for the magnitude of the relief operation that Canada was getting engaged in. But in a sense, it didn't really matter because there was a broad measure of consensus among the opinion makers that this was a good thing for us to be doing. And, uh, and so the country really rallied behind it. In the, in the local situation here, Marion Dewar was absolutely the key player. Uh, she, uh, she was a wonderful example, in my view, of political leadership. Uh, she, in a sense, kind of uh, got into it almost spontaneously. Uh, well, in a nutshell, she and her husband were away on a weekend, uh, and uh, I guess this would have been in June of 1979. And uh, it was a rainy weekend, there wasn't much to do, so they were playing bridge with another couple. They had the TV going in the background. And the TV was overwhelmed by these images of, uh, of boat people, uh, not only having suffered terribly in escaping from Vietnam, but being pushed back into the ocean by these countries where they hoped to find refuge. Now, there were all sorts of reasons why that happened, but Marion and her husband found that absolutely appalling. They just thought this was a, a depth of the horror that they could barely imagine. And it was so contrary to their own values, they said, we really have to do something about it. Now picture this, this is a, a municipal mayor of a medium-large Canadian city with absolutely no mandate to get involved in foreign affairs of any kind. Uh, she was so upset by what was going on that she called a meeting uh, in uh, late June to which she invited a number of community leaders, religious leaders, and a, uh, a, a, the Minister of Immigration. The Minister didn't come. But he sent uh, one, of his, uh, one of his officials, and the official, uh, he was facing a pretty rough crowd, uh, tried to tell people how much Canada was already doing. You know, and, she said, and they said, he said, you know, we've, uh, we've got a quota this year of 8,000 people. That was quite big because uh, the previous year I think it had been 5,000. Before that it had been in the hundreds range. We've got a quote of 8,000 people, and we've got 4,000 that already lined up. And Marion just said, we'll take the other 4,000. 
And her point was really, you know, this is no, not enough. We really have to be doing more. Mm -hmm. But that was the, the genesis of Project 4000. It was a flip comment that she made in, a, uh, iron, in an ironic way to say a country this size and a city this size can do a lot better than this. So she just basically said, we'll take the other 4,000. And then uh, the press got wind of this on the way out. And she said, yeah, we're, we're thinking, we're thinking of doing something for the refugees. And we're thinking, you know, we could take up to 4,000. We're a city of 300,000 people, da, 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 da. So the next day or so, there was a headline. She realized that this was getting, this was getting well ahead of her, uh, of her, of her thinking. So she, she consulted a number of members of the municipal council and uh, that's when they decided to hold a, uh, a large public consultation in early July. To make that happen, they set up a working group and uh, just to give you some idea of what was involved in it, um, this, was the original, this was the original structure of Project 4000. They show you what the groups were trying to deal with. First of all, accommodation. Where are these folks going to live? Health. Who's going to check them out? Some of these people had some major, major uh, health concerns after having living, lived in, in refugee camps for, for a considerable period of time. The media, who had already shown that they were a tremendous ally and also people to pay attention to in this. Education. Where do we go from here? What do we do with the kids? How do they go? Employment. These folks were desperate to... Re I mean, employment meant more than just getting a job for the incoming refugee. For, for a lot of them... For a lot of, particularly the men, I think it was a way of reestablishing themselves, reestablishing their own integrity and their value as, as human beings. The, uh, they had such a, an enthusiastic response from the, from the sponsorship groups that they found that they could move away from doing a lot of the, uh, of the actual work themselves and to serve more as a clearinghouse. So they did things, for example, like setting up a, uh, a warehouse, a clothing depot. Because as you noticed, you mentioned before, people coming in dealing with the first Canadian winter. My God, that's an experience and a half. Eh? So just providing people with decent winter clothes uh, was, uh, you know, was something. Furniture. People would arrive. Somebody would say, well, there's an offer of a free apartment somewhere, but you'll have to furnish it yourself. Well, somebody whose only possessions in this world are what he can carry in a suitcase is, is, isn't going to have too much in the way of household furniture. So they set up a depot where you could just go and, and get furniture that had been donated there. So they played this kind of overarching, coordinating role. And they left it to the sponsorship groups to meet the people, to help to work with them on a daily basis, to help them find jobs and get integrated that way. So that was really the, the role that Project 4000 uh, at, the, at the level of, or of an organization took to itself. It, it, it was initially set up to, to help people uh, reestablish. The public uh, response was so great that they could evolve in, a, in more of a coordinating role. And they did, they kept that going for about 18 months or so. Was, that was the critical right. phase. So I'm wondering, like, you know, there's obviously a cultural barrier, but there's like, you know, Canadian winters, right? So how how do like how was that like process for the refugees coming to Ottawa? Yeah, it was a it was a toughie. It was a it was a hard one. I mean, uh, and there are all sorts of stories when you when you talk to people uh, who go back to that time of of uh, the first winter. Wow, and some some of them really quite funny too. I mean, you know, snow is a beautiful thing, and these some kids had never seen snow before. And I remember somebody telling me they were so loved what it looked like that they went and they got some brown paper bags and they filled it with snow and then they took it home and they put it in the house <laughs> because it was so beautiful. And of course, the next morning, <laughs> I don't think their parents were, were quite as happy with them. Um, but that's where, that's where Project 4000 and, and other similar uh, initiatives across the country really uh, played a key role. Um, you know that they, there was a sponsorship program in place so that for every privately sponsored refugee, the government would match funds and, and bring them in. And they did a, a good workman's like job in doing that. But they did it with the instruments that they had, which was basically you know, administrative administration and money. What private groups like uh, Project 4000 and the sponsorship groups brought to the table was a, a one-on-one a, a one -on -one contact, if you like. So uh, whenever a newcomer uh, ran up with a problem, going to, for a medical exam for the first time, for example, uh, never having had that experience before, they could talk to somebody, they could get some help. Uh, I remember somebody telling me that they, one of the people that they were with, 
They had ne never seen traffic lights the way we use them here, for example. And this woman sort of stepped off the curb and was about to walk out into the middle, you know, on a, uh, on a, uh, on a red light. And the traffic was going, so they grabbed them and pulled them back. You know, there were all sorts of, uh, of episodes like this. And so because the, the sponsorships groups were, so, were involved directly with the individuals, they, they acted as sort of local friends. They knew, they, knew, they knew the local ropes, if you like, and they could help people find where to shop, find a doctor, uh, find a, a job. That was a biggie. There was an evaluation that was carried out later by, I think, CEIC uh, and some of the federal organizations, and they found that uh, the, uh, the privately sponsored refugees uh, they had a tough time of it, but not so tough of a time as the people who had been government sponsored by the government. They, they tended to take less time to, to adapt themselves, less time to find a job, cost less in terms of integration. Uh, so it turned out to be a really positive experience. And it's one that, uh, that immigration took, uh, learned uh, over the years because they put into place a, a similar sort of program, a friendship program that helped help, and I think it still does, excuse me, I think they still have something equivalent to that operating now, where they try to, to match up in new coming people with, uh, with local people who will help them to, to find their way around. There was one wonderful story uh, that was told to me by a Cambodian friend, one of the fellows I interviewed, and I, I wrote it up in the, in the book, but uh, just very briefly, he was the only one of a Cambodian group of four or five who, who spoke any English at all, and uh, when he arrived here, <clears throat> excuse me, he found that uh, they were received, they were government sponsored, I guess, and the fellow did his job. He brought them to a hotel and he gave them some food money and the room keys and said, you know, it's Friday afternoon, not much will happen now until Monday, you know, have a good weekend and off he went. Well, that's fine, but the thing is nobody in this group uh, the, uh, of Cambodians had ever seen a Western style hotel key before. And they didn't know what to do with it. And so Shamroon was telling me he knew what the numbers meant, but they didn't line up with anything they could see. So eventually uh, they were in a quandary because it would have been very impolite in their view to have to ask, was this something that we should know about on our own? Uh, who can we turn to, to, to explain what's going on here? Are we going to be rude to our hosts if the first thing we say is we don't understand here? What do we do? Finally, somebody helped him out and said, well, the first two numbers mean the floor and the last two numbers mean the room and fine. And it got straightened out. But uh, they went down to the dining room and they saw that on the menu there were hot dogs. And they thought that was an appalling notion. Canadians, we're in a country where they eat dog. And, oh, no, this is awful. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, they found their way over to the minuscule Chinatown that existed at the time in Ottawa, and there at least they saw decent food <laughs> that they could at least recognize and uh, and get on. So the sorts, if you if you think for a minute, if you've ever been in a foreign environment uh, where nothing is familiar to you, not the language, not the climate, not the way people do, and you think. That's the situation that these folks were in. You know, they'd been uprooted very largely. They'd had a horrific time, many, many of them getting here, long and arduous, painful, often with, with illnesses. Then to arrive here uh, in, a, in a completely foreign kind of foreign in a sense that, you know, we can barely understand today. Uh, maybe if we were set down in the middle of, oh, I don't know, in the middle of northern Nigeria or something, it might, we might get that sort of an image, but, uh, but really, really tough. What's amazing to me is how well they did, you know. I mean, uh, it was tough, but, uh, but they were all very, very resilient, hardworking, dedicated to making a new life for themselves, and, and they did, and they succeeded beautifully. Now, in, so this was by way of background as to you, so you suddenly had this huge flow of people out not just from Vietnam. It's important to remember that when we talk about uh, the Southeast uh, Asian uh, refugee crisis, we're also very much talking about the Cambodians and the Laotians as well. The Vietnamese were by far the largest group who came, and numbers would dictate that. They were probably 78, 80 percent, something like that, of the group who arrived uh, here in Ottawa. Uh, probably a little bit lower, but also a very strong majority in Canada as a whole. But the Cambodians and the Laotians were also uh, very much on the run too, uh, for for all sorts of good reasons. So he, here's this huge surge of people in desperate need of help. They're being pushed away by uh, by the uh, the local uh, authorities where they might have sought haven, 
and the and the international community is at uh, wit's end what to what to do about it. Locally, the economy in Canada, the economy is not in terribly great shape at that time, and people are saying, well, what is this? I mean, we're going to bring in a whole lot of people who are going to be taking our jobs away from us, and they'll be. Uh, remaking the country, uh, there'll be a flood of people who are not, quote, like us. So the, the objections to our getting deeply involved, some of them shaded into outright racism, no question about it. Some of them were, I don't know, quasi-legitimate, and since people worried about the possible economic impact of uh, a huge flood of uh, new labor, if you like, and they wondered about what it would do to the cities. What's interesting, and this is something that impressed me uh, later on when I, I was researching it, uh, when you look at it 30 years or 40 years later, you realize all those concerns are really quite empty. I mean, there, nothing of that sort happened. I mean, the people who came contributed. They were productive very quickly. Uh, the neighborhoods that they moved into, they improved <laughs> because they tended to settle in the centers of towns that had been that had gone downhill for years, and suddenly these places became livable again. The whole country benefited, but this fearful approach—that's a part of our character as well. You know, a stranger out there is going to take something away that I have now. Um, there, there was that element uh, there. And thanks to the leaders of the day, and I say locally, Marion Dewar, at the federal level to Joe Clark, Flora McDonald, these were the people who really drove the policy at the time. Uh, those views were basically heard, but basically dismissed and marginalized. And we got on with it, got on with it to the point where, as you know, Canada was the country that had the largest per capita uh, intake of uh, of, uh, of refugees in the uh, in the entire critical period. There's a there's a real paradox associated with this notion of being a refugee because obviously to be a refugee means there's been a defeat somewhere and it sounds as though it's it's the product of defeat. But in a very real sense, in a very in a different sense, to become a refugee is uh, basically to contest, to, to deny despair. It's, uh, it's an unwillingness to accept that you're over and you're done. So in a sense, it's a, uh, it's the, perhaps the origin was in a, a military conflict and a defeat somewhere, but I think people become refugees because they're not willing to despair of their lives and of, uh, of their futures. And most of all, they're not prepared to sacrifice you know, their families. So there's this intriguing paradox that, yeah, there's a, a really bad military experience somewhere back there, but the people who re they, they have rebelled against, they have not accepted that as the determination for all time of their lives. And that's what I think is so, uh, so appealing about the people who made the trip, the courage that they showed. It was amazing. It was amazing. The things that they went through, I mean, the, uh, not only was it bad enough trying to cross the South China, she South China Sea, but they had, there was piracy, uh, there were shootouts on the way, there were awful things that happened, all sorts of ways. Um, I talked to a number of people when I was doing the book, and it, 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 people said some, some really interesting things. They went through how their prosperity had been taken away, how the freedom that they'd had had pretty well been eliminated, how they were suspect because they were on the wrong side of the regime. And they'd say, you know, I might have been willing to stick it out for myself. I just couldn't live knowing that my children had no no future because they had no future because they were because in a regime like that class origin was everything so if you were if you came from a particular class didn't matter how brilliant or whatever you were you still weren't going to be anywhere you were marginalized uh, so and that's one of the things that prompted people to go and so I don't know how, I, I didn't grow up in a refugee family, but I, I know a little bit about people who've been off to war and how often they're traumatized by the experience and they can't really explain it to anybody else. But I really think, you know, the, the kids and the grandkids of the, of the incoming refugees, they should know how courageous they were and how heroic they were to, to have made that trip because uh, it was really quite remarkable.